practice that we would like to share, but we can't share them because they're personal, and we'll try to share a few. Um, when I was 18 years old, uh, I became a pastor's wife. I feel like I'm echoing. Is that true? Okay, good. I became a pastor's wife, and so I had to learn things fast and the hard way. 18 years old, you hardly know who you are, <laughs> much, less, much less what you're supposed to be. So things I would like to share today are from 18 years old until 80, almost 86. And they really come down to just a very few basic facts. When I was praying about this, uh, I said, Lord, what can I, what can I possibly say to, uh, to encourage everybody? Because we're such a vast uh, variety of personalities and ages here. And as I just got those words out of my mouth, before I had time to construct a sentence, these words came to me. They are precious in my sight. They are precious in my sight. Now, it had to be from the Lord because, you know, I, I don't know that much. <laughs> but, but I thought, well, that's precious. So I looked up the word precious. Now, you, I, I doubt if there's a sister in here, especially the pastor's wives, who feel adequate for what the Lord has called you to do. I think if I ask for a show of hands, no one would raise their hand that you feel adequate. But you know, and I know, God does not call the equipped. He equips the caller, the, the one he calls. And uh, so that's from that, that's where we're going today. But remember, he told me, I think it was the Lord because it wasn't my brain. My brain wasn't working that fast. You're precious. You are precious. Now think about your own self, your inadequacies, the times you have failed, all of the things that make us human beings. Primary, you are precious in the sight of the Lord. And that's what matters. So the, the term precious, and, and this is something, uh, it means costly. It means rare. It means not common. It means of high value. It means cherished. It's a substance or a resource of great value. Not to be wasted or treated carelessly greatly loved or treasured by someone. The effect of precious is elegant or refined behavior in language and manner. You are precious in the eyes of the Lord. So I just wrote out the word precious. And let's take the P in precious. The primary thing of any woman, but a pastor's wife especially, is prayer. I will tell you, if you are not a praying woman, you are a struggling woman. And if you are not a praying woman, 
you are a worrying woman. If you are not a praying woman, you are working way above your calling. I've told different younger ones, pray about everything. Everything. Small things, big things, people, decisions. Pray about everything. Our personal, another P here is our personal walk with God is primary to be an effective assistant or a help to your husband. If our own personal walk with our Savior is not up to date and daily, we don't have enough in us to give out or to be a helpmate. So those two things, the P's here, pray, about everything and our personal walk with God. And I will ask you this, do you ever dread going to service? Don't shake your heads, don't, just, I think they're filming this, so you, you don't wanna, you don't wanna see the back of the heads going like this or that. But do you ever dread going to service? I mean, I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure it happens more than some would like to admit. Okay. Uh, sometimes the reason for that, not always, sometimes you're just sick and tired, <laughs> but sometimes the reason for that is because we have lost our first love. Our first love. If we lose our first love for the Lord, then it becomes very difficult to do the job he's called us to do because our focus is on us and our problems and every other thing. So anytime you think, oh, I dread going to service tonight, ask ourselves, Wait a minute. Why am I this? Why am I even in this at all? What is my purpose? What is my calling? What is my salvation? It comes it's very simple. It's very very simple. Jesus God sent Jesus. And sometimes we forget that it was God the Father that sent him. You know, he he didn't just come on his own. <laughs> I mean, God, our Father, sent him, and he died for us and rose again. If he had just died, that would have been a dead sacrifice. But he rose again and conquered death and sin for us. He's our Savior. When we lose sight of that, we lose sight of our first love. And then we have to go back to that basic always. He filled us with the very life of God. Jesus said, I go to the Father. He will send a comforter. Look at all that God the Father did for us. We have to remember those things, see. And sometimes we get so bogged down in our dailies that we forget. I'm a child of God and I'm precious in his sight. We have to remember that. Personal walk with God is primary in this. And then we have an R, PR. Of course, part of this personal walk is reading the Word of God. There are a number of women who depend only on their husband's knowledge of the Word of God. And whatever he teaches, whatever he says, that's part of me, too, and that's a truth. But your personal walk with God and your personal salvation depends on what did he say to you 
in the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Don't just hurry through your daily, I got to read my three, three chapters, so I'll make sure I have it all at the end of the year and I can raise my hand. Did you read your Bible? No, no. I mean, we do that. Yes, we do that to encourage others. But get in the Word. Study the Word. Let it become your mind. Because everything you face as a pastor's wife, and I'm not excluding anybody who's not a pastor's wife because truth is truth, but everything you face, the answer is in the Word of God. Every situation, things that happen to you that you, when I was 20 years old, of course, you have to remember I was in a religion uh, organization. I was not here. And things are different there. The pastor's wife is basically the pastor also. You, you pastor together. It's a couple thing. And I had a lady, when I was in my 20 years old, and a, our, one of our uh, Sunday school teachers came to me and she said, I need to talk to you. Now, this is an experience. She said, I'm having an affair with the Sunday school superintendent. Now, both of them are married. I'm 20 years old. What do you do with that? The word of God. The word of God. Repent. Counsel, you don't tell anybody at all about that news. And you're really careful how and when you tell your husband because some husbands have an explosion uh, at times. <laughs> Not my dear husband. John Peach has never exploded that I know of. But this was years ago. But with great wisdom, you delve into the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about this? What are we going to do about this? If it gets out, it will split the church wide open. So you carry that in your heart. You pray about it. You talk with your husband about it ends up counseling, save both marriages, and save the church. But I say all that because at that time I was so desperate because I did not know anything that I sought the Lord on everything. And he's the one that gave the wisdom to deal with that. You can get wisdom from God. I mean, think about it, really. You can get wisdom from the mighty God of heaven for every situation. But study the word, read the word. Um, and of course, another R, PR, you have to be real. There are times when you have to act in a manner that you really don't want to and you don't feel like it, and you'd like to be really real, but the real you is wanting to do the will of God and wanting to be an example. And you have to, um, I'm saying you have to, I have to, we all have to be reliable. You can't give your word and not follow your word. If you have told someone in your congregation you're going to do something and then all of a sudden your husband has other plans you need definitely to go to that person and say i'm really sorry i can't do this which i'll just throw this in it's okay to say no sometimes to some requests i'm sorry i can't do that i heard I heard one of the greatest statements the other day from 
from a young pastor's wife. She said, I answered then, I can't make any plans on my own. I can't make any plans on my own. Because there are times when different ones would want to call you away and, oh, let's go shopping, oh, let's do this, let's do that. I'm sorry, I can't make any plans on my own. It's a word of wisdom. I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful answer. And then, of course, under the R, we have rejoicing. Rejoicing, which is praise. And... One, one scripture I love in the Word of God, oh, let me see where it is, I think it's, oh yeah, it's, I have it written, it's 1 Thessalonians 1, 16, 17, 18. Do you know that you're supposed to rejoice in everything? Everything. Now, just take a moment here, and what is the most difficult thing you are at this moment in your life going through? the most difficult. Can you rejoice in that? See, the Bible says to praise the Lord in and for all things. This is the will of God concerning you. You, you, you put those scriptures together and that's how it ends up. And you can praise your way out of any situation or through any situation and in any situation, and it will carry you through. Um, Merlin Carruthers wrote a book years ago before some of you were ever thought of, and it's called Prison to Praise. I would recommend, I would recommend you reading that book. He was in prison. And through circumstances, he began to praise the Lord. I mean, we're talking prison over, uh, overseas in the war. And he began to praise the Lord. It worked miracles in his life. Praising the Lord is your, back to your personal contact with God. See how important your personal walk is in all of this ministry. It's your personal walk with God. I can, I do get off on that, don't I? Okay, sorry. Okay, we have P-R-E. Now, what do you think is the first word that starts with E that I'm going to say? Shout it out. Example. Yes. Example. Oh, that's a hard one but the Lord has equipped us for that. He either through our spirit, he, he talks to our spirit, he lets us know, uh-uh, uh-uh, not, not quite. Not hungry. You know, have you ever heard the spirit say, mm, mm. you know, when a child goes to touch something, uh-uh. Has the spirit ever said that to you? Isn't that precious? What if he didn't? What if the Lord didn't deal with us? He would love us if he didn't deal with us. So, example. Of course, we talk a lot about dress standards. The reason we talk about dress standards and the reason we have them is because a number of reasons, but I won't hit them all. Number one, we want to be, okay, let me just put it this way. We don't ever want to dress in a way that we could not bow before the Lord. There's a cute little saying that says, uh, raise your hands and touch your toes. If anything shows, Go change your clothes. <laughs> and when you think about it, that's really kind of true. And while I'm on this, 
I'm sorry for whoever male might be watching while I'm on this. Get a, a full-length mirror. Every home should have a full-length mirror. Get a mirror in your hand and walk. Sorry. Uh, we don't always face people head on. A lot of our communication is behind us. So get a full length mirror and see what others see behind you. It's quite amazing. I said, it's quite amazing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Under the, under the letter E is also encouraging. You are the ultimate encourager. I mean, it just goes with the calling. Mm -hmm. You are the ultimate encourager. Should I stand somewhere else? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if I have it written down here anywhere. It's very difficult for me to follow notes, so I'm sorry. You just have to. Um, I'll just I'll just put this in right here. Your your primary job as a pastor's wife, and I probably should have said this first, but you know I could have had that under P primary. Yeah. So if you're taking notes, put that under your P. Yeah, and I do have this if you need a copy of it. So, um, your primary number one thing is your husband. I mean, obviously you wouldn't be a pastor's wife if you didn't have a husband. He is your primary focus. He comes before everybody else. Sometimes he's wrong, and we know it. At least, we think we do. And I say that because pastors and husbands make decisions. They make a lot of decisions. They have to. We probably would not have made that decision that exact way at that exact time with those exact words. There are times when you just think differently than that man does. But those are times we gently keep our mouth closed and we pray. If the Lord, the Lord, opens the opportunity we could share a little gentle opinion about something that perhaps we disagree on. But primary for our husband is to know we are with him. He is number one in our life other than the Lord. The children come after the husband. You had him first. He's got first place there. Even when he knows you disagree. He needs to know you are by his side. You are his number one fan. You are going to back him. You're going to stand by him regardless. He needs to know that. It's vital. Because, trust me, he feels very alone. Very, very, very alone sometimes. And hates some of the decisions he has to make. But if he knows my little wife is right here, she's going to be with me. If I make a mistake, she's with me. If I'm a success, she is with me. If she disagrees with me, she is with me. Your husband needs to be told that, and he needs to know that for sure. 
And every once in a while, you need to tell him again, honey, I love you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm right here. Because, you know, men are And they need, they need love. They need comfort. They need the softness of their wives. They do. Okay, I'll, I'll get off of that. Okay, P-R-E. Oh, on the E, you also need to be enjoyable to be around. Shall I expound on that? Is that adequate? Okay. And you need to be ever ready. This is the most traveling, going group of women in the entire world. And wouldn't you just sometimes love to stay at home? But you need to be ever ready. If he said, we're, we're going to, okay, when are we going? What do we need to take? How long are we going to be gone? You know I don't know what I say. <laughs> Somebody tell me what is, oh, ever ready. <laughs> yeah, ever ready, you know, like a battery. Yeah. Ever ready. Yes, ever ready to, to do God's will and your husband's will. And prayerfully, they're the same thing. Okay. All right, P-R-E-C. C. Fits everyone in this room, especially the minister's wives. If your husband is called, you are called. You say, I'm not called. Yes, you are called. Just accept it. That's the way it is. I don't want to be called. Well, that's too bad. Just accept it. That's the way it is. If he's called, you are called. You're called to stand by his side. You're called to love the saints. You're called to die to self. You're called for a lot of things. But most of all, you're called by your, by your father, in whom sight you are precious. He has called you. He called you. You remember that. When it gets tough, no, he called me. This is not, I didn't volunteer. He called me. I'm going to do this job. Whatever I do or don't want to do, he called me. I will do what he wants me to do because he gave his life for me. You know, go back to that. You have to remind yourself, who, who bought me? Who bought me? I'm redeemed. I will go. I will call. Yes, I'll do this. Okay. And then in, beer, in your calling, you have to be courteous, always. And there are times when you do not feel courteous, but you have to be courteous. And that comes back to the P. If you are prayed up, you will be courteous. If you are not prayed up, you perhaps will not be courteous. But you need to be courteous. That goes with it. You need to be careful. Now, being careful means caring enough to be careful. And the greatest way we offend is with what? With our words. Oh, our words. We have to be careful with our words. You are quoted in homes. You are quoted to children. Things you say never die unless you make a public apology to the whole world. They never die. They're always floating somewhere in someone's mind, in someone's home. So be careful with your words. And that's a lesson I learned very young. I am not required to have an opinion on everything. 
it does not go with this calling. You can be free from having an opinion. It isn't a requirement. So just if, if it's something you don't know what to do about, you don't have to have an opinion on it. Just if somebody says, what do you think? You may freely say, I don't have an opinion on it. I don't have to have an opinion on it. And one example I will uh, say here, uh, a minister had, uh, had a great fall, great fall. And the word was getting around. And someone called me and said, what do you think of that? And I said, I, I'm free from judgment on that. I don't have to have an opinion. It's not my business. I don't have to let that enter in to my category of work. It's not my opinion. It's up to the Lord. It's not my opinion. So you learn that phrase, and it frees you from a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. Okay, uh, where are we? Uh, careful. Okay, we have to be careful with our words. And, of course, another C is we have to be concerned about the saints. They know if you really care, if you're really concerned, they know that. If you don't care and if you're not concerned, then hit the floor with your knees and say, Lord, I don't even like this person in my own self. And I will give you an example. I'm sorry, sister. Am I talking too long? Okay. Um, I will give you this example. Uh, you know that song, and, I've, and you've heard this before, some have had. The song, uh, Down From His Glory, uh, Everlast. Oh, how I love him, how I adore him, my Savior, my friend. You know that old, sorry, uh, uh, song. It's written to O Solo Mio <laughs> tune that was written by Booth Cliburn, and uh, he was raised... Uh, Salvation Army, his mother's or grandmother started it, I think. Anyhow, he was uh, evangelist, and he and his evangelistic group had run out of money, so they were working in the fields. And uh, the thought came to him, oh, how I love him. You know, he was trying to prepare for the service that night. Oh, how I love him. The little... He said, that could be a song, you know. But it needs to start at the top. Oh, how I love him. So he just got that right there. Oh, how I love him. And that song is just blessed and blessed and blessed. He, in my opinion, was the rudest, crudest, mm, person. He was, in my opinion. I did not like him. He visited our church one day, and I was sitting in the front pew, and I had my Bible, which in those days, all of your notes that you might speak on were in your Bible, you know, just in case. You, you just had your notes in there. And so, I was sitting in the front row, and my Bible was laying here. He came in service late, sat down right here, and uh, the preacher said something he disagreed with. He picks up my Bible and flings it like this. Not, not fling it, but he, you know, he raises it, all my notes. Went, you know, and I'm thinking, mm hmm And then he he began to proceed to argue with the pastor. And then, of course, you know, he put my Bible back down, and I gathered all my notes up, and, and my spirit was not happy, and I didn't like him to begin with. So I knew, uh, the Lord convicted me of that, and I knew I, 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 can't, live with, I can't live with this in my heart. And that's something we examine today, what is in our heart. 
I cannot live and go on in God with this in my heart. So I prayed. And I said, Lord, I do not like William Booth Cliburn. I do not like him. I think he's rude. And I don't like him. Will you please put a love in my heart for him? Because I can't do it. I cannot do it. And as I was praying, an overwhelming love and understanding came into my heart for that man. It was just like the Lord opened my eyes to who he was, where he had been, what he had been through. And I just had this overwhelming love for him. And um, it was not long after that that he passed away. And I cried. I really cried because I didn't want to lose him. I just had gotten love yet. I didn't want to lose him. But that's what God can do through prayer and through uh, seriousness and through reality. We have to admit to God where we are, who we are. Lord, you know. You know my heart. And I just, uh, I just want to share that because I know that a lot of us do go, do go through that. So I will just hurry here. Um, where are we on the I, P R E C I? Okay, I will, I will say two things on this. Uh, a pastor's wife that is very dear to all of us was going through an immensely difficult time. She had lost her husband, and she was going through a very, very difficult time. And she realized that some things in the situation were not going to change. So her words to me were, I know it's not going to change, but I want to go through this right. I want to go through this right. And that's kind of where we are. Whatever. Let us pray. I, I want to go through this right, Lord. You've taught us how to do it. I want to go through this right. It's an opportunity for me to go through this right. The other I that I will mention is how indispensable you are to your husband. And I've already covered a little bit of that. But if you, if you look up the word indispensable, it will show you your value. And you are indispensable to him. Going on to the O, of course, the thing the first thing is others. That's, that's why we live. We live for others. Pastor's wife lives for others. And so um, uh, I, I, I'm going to hurry here. I don't want to. So when you're dealing with others, uh, you need to ask this question. In my dealing with them, little things that come up, big things that come up, you have to ask yourself, is it eternal? Is this eternal, what I'm going through with them? Is it really eternal, or is it going to be gone next month? And those are questions that we need to ask ourselves all the time in anything we do. Is this eternal? Is this, getting, is this worth uh, even getting upset or wondering about? Is it eternal? And will it matter? In a hundred years. No, it won't matter in a hundred years. Does it serve a purpose? Does what we're going through serve a purpose? If it doesn't serve an eternal purpose, then let it go. Let it go. Uh, okay, you, of course, you have to be understanding. And you have to be understanding in both sides of a situation. Make sure, always, remember there's two sides. If somebody comes to you or your husband and you happen to be involved in the conversation, there are always two sides. Always be understanding. 
and be unspoken. Unspoken. <laughs> That's the word for us. When we could speak, a lot of times it would be wise to be unspoken. Because like I say, your words definitely will follow you. And then the, the S, of course, is that you are a servant. And another S is a soft answer turns away wrath. So... That's all I'm going to share today. Remember these things. Is it eternal? Does it serve a purpose? And then, as many of you in this room know, I always say, it's not what you go through. It's how you go through it that matters. One little poem I will read. You cannot be as others are who walk the world in fun. For you were chosen as one apart before the world began. He chooses whom he will. And so he said, I choose this one to walk as I desired to walk before the world began. It's not an easy task to climb the pathway with a son. He walks in paths unknown to men, set ere the world began. Pray about everything. God bless you. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Um, I, well, didn't y'all enjoy Sister uh, Peach this morning? Wish I could start all over now in the ministry. I was 22 when the Lord called Glenn to preach, so I have been around just a little bit. Um, I thought when the Lord told her that that these people were precious in in his sight. Well, you know, the Lord don't speak to me like that. I thought of, I thought of the, just adding that just then. He speaks to me like who died and left you in charge. <laughs> really? And then, and then, he, then he speaks to me, um, you get what you get and don't you store a fit. All week long in vacation Bible school, every time I'd give my little granddaughter, Madison, her third grade teacher would tell her that. She'd give him a, a yellow crayon. And uh, some of them would say, I don't want to yell. And the teacher would say, you get what you get, and don't you throw a fit. Well, then I was do, doing vacation Bible school all that week working with the children. And, and uh, at the end of the week, all week long, I'd say, you get what you get, and don't you throw a fit now, honey. And so then that Saturday night we were going to do the program, somebody said something to me. And the Lord just spoke to me. I didn't like what they said. But, you know, you're supposed to be sweet, Sister Peach. Uh, I just said, that the Lord spoke to me and said, you get what you get and don't you throw a fit. <laughs> so he just threw that right back in my face. And then one time we were at a church and, uh, and I had told her about it before. A sister um, had said something to the preacher. And in my mind, I went, we don't do that. And I said, oh, God, you know, in my mind, my facial expression didn't change or nothing. Y'all know me. Anyway, so. Uh, um, I'm supposed to tell funny things. So that happened in the ministry. So the Lord just spoke to me and said, Aunt, I didn't know how to spell that. <laughs> so anyway, I said, oh, okay, okay. So I straightened up and she said it again to the preacher. And I went, oh my God. And so the Lord just spoke to me again and said, Aunt. And I said, I knew that. He said, this is of me. So I knew then this was a little bit of a different case. So but I appreciate being here today. And those are just a few of the little things. I'm not through yet. 
Uh, those are just a few of the little things that the Lord has dealt with me about. He has called my name about 10 times during my whole life. He knows my name, and I do know that. But I thought of, I'm so glad to be here with all my BFFs. And if I don't see you, it's because of this little disease I have, but it's not. I, um, I won't put this in. I have so many CNI dolls. I don't have CNI dogs. I have seen our dolls in the body of Christ that carry me around and take care of me, and I really appreciate each and every one of y'all. But I was thinking of my BFFs and all my besties, and I love each and every one of you. And we have a little girl in our church when she first came. She was four years old. And um, she'd come up on, one night, she'd come up on the platform, sit on the steps, and she said, come here, Sister Walker. And I said, what you want, Chloe? And she said, just come here. And so when I got there, she, she said, you look like you need a hug. And I said, oh, my Lord, yes, I do from you. So I was her bestie right then, and she was my bestie. And then the next week, she come up to the platform, and, and I thought it was for me, but uh, Tammy said, come here, Chloe. She said, I, I got you a little bitty bag. bag. I'm going to give you something. So every week, Tammy started giving her a little bag, so it switched from me to Tammy. Then a few weeks later, Sister Abraham, um, no, it was Sister Phillips next. Abraham. Uh, she started doing a little bit more for her, so she ended up being her bestie. And then it was Sister Phillips. So this little girl went from everybody, so she, I think she ended up being everybody's bestie. But I appreciate being with each and every one of y'all today. Um, I was going to tell a story. I asked Brother uh, Dennis White last night. I said, is this your story or was it Brother Br Bud's story? And he said, this is Brother Bud's story. So uh, one time there was a, a pet shop, and in that pet shop, the owner had put a parrot right up front. And uh, it was a talking parrot. So when all the customers would come in, he would talk to the customers. And so... Um, when this one couple come in, he said, uh, he said, come here. So he told us, well, he didn't wave his wing like that, but he said, come here. <laughs> so uh, the couple come over there, and he said, sir, do you know you have the ugliest, homiest looking wife I've ever seen in all my life? And that man went, oh, I can't believe this. So he went and told the owner. So the owner said, well, I'll take care of him tonight. So that night, the um, the owner took the parrot back and beat him up and beat him up. He said, don't you ever talk to my customers that way again. So a few weeks went by, and that couple come back in the pet shop again. And so um, that um, parrot, they looked over at the parrot, and the parrot said, come here. And so he, they walked over there, and he said, she's still the ugliest, homeless look, looking. Um, stop, you know how that stop a clock woman I've ever seen in all my life. So they went and told the owner again. So the owner beat him up again that night, that little parrot again. He said, next time you do that, I'm going to put you in the freezer, and that's the end of you. So uh, a few weeks went by, and that couple come back in the store, and they they looked over at the parrot. I mean, yeah, and the parrot looked over at him, and the, that man said, what? And that parrot said, you know what? So he didn't repeat it so he didn't get in the freezer. The reason I'm telling this is I'm going to say, you know what? The Lord, sometimes the Lord looks at us, and, you know, we already know what we should be doing. And uh, he'll just say, you know what? And that's what we need to be doing. But right now we're going to do you know what? Um, I want everybody, do not move. Put your... Bible and your purse, if, unless you got a table, you can put it on. Put it so nobody will trip over it. This is going to take a few minutes. But I think it's very important that we all get together. I sang, uh, I was sitting with a sister in Russellville at a fellowship meeting, and um, they were singing, This is my life. This is what I live for, just to be with God's people in this hour, just to be a part of what he's doing. So I looked over at that sister sitting next to me, and I said, oh, I bet our, our part of the body wrote that song. 
And she said, no. She said, our part of the body wrote that song. And I said, well, what part of the body are you? And she said, well, I'm with Brother Pinnock's group. So that sister's name was, let me look that up. Uh, Sister Mears, Sister Myers. Alita, Alita K. Spencer, Alita K. Spencer wrote that from the Pinox group. Well, at that time, there was the Pinox group. There was our group, the campground group, Goodwin's group, and Brother Jolly's group. But you know, we're all blended back together now. And so I'm so thankful for that. Well, right now, I want everybody to put their purse, not beside your chair, but under your chair. Now, if you can look across the table and you don't know that sister, then that's fine. But if you know that sister, get up and find somebody in this room that you do not know. And I'm going to give y'all two minutes to do that. Without talking, find somebody you don't really know very well and go sit by them. You'll come back to your table, but go sit by them now. Yeah. Okay, do it quickly. Quickly, quickly, quickly. <laughs> Don't talk. Don't talk. Just go sit by him. Here we go. Do not talk to anybody. Just go find somebody and sit by them that you don't know. Go find somebody. <laughs> Five, four, Three, two, one. All right, everybody sit. Everybody sit down. They don't ever do that. Yes, everybody sit down. All right, here we go. Is everybody seated? All right, here we go. Sit down.
All right, has everybody found somebody that you don't know very well? I know everybody's seen everybody. All right, now, now we can start talking when I start the timer, okay? So then you I know everybody. That's what they don't they don't get the rest of the story. Yeah. All right. What we're supposed to have done. <laughs> I think I, I thought I explained it right, but I have a bad time about doing that. You're supposed to find, wait, don't say a word. You're supposed to find somebody you don't know and, or know real well. But we've all seen everybody. Find somebody you don't know real very well. Sit by them. Sit down. Don't say a word. And then when I do a timer, then you start saying something. Lord, Lord. What? I think we all got our exercise for the morning. Okay. That's, that, that's kind of, I was trying to get everybody to get to know everybody more. Because I wrote the song, Let's Build a Body, here in Hearst, Texas. Before Hearst become Hearst real well. Uh, when Brother Patton was still here. So um, I believe in building the body of Christ. I believe in building your sisters up. So now I want to tell all right, we're not going to do what I was going to do. It's called an icebreaker, a very good icebreaker, to get everybody to learn everybody. If I don't speak to you, it's because I don't see you real well. Brother Dennis McClure, I'm going to tell off on him one day. He told Leah, he said, well, I guess Betty's mad at me. And she said, well, why, Dennis? You know Betty loves you. And uh, she said, uh, he said, well, she ain't, she ain't, he said, I've waved the whole meeting at her. And she's not waving back. He said, Dennis, she can't see you. She can't see that far. So it's not because I don't love each and every one of you. It's just sometimes I just can't see. Come up closer to me and start talking. And I'll, I have a mouth. I'm the mouth of the South. So I, I will talk to y'all. And if you talk, I'll talk back to you. I was going to tell you one time before I tell this other thing. I was going to tell you one time about the plane ride I rode with Brother and Sister Bud. I actually got on the plane with Brother Bud. And so he, he flew down to Tampa and picked us up, and then we flew down to Key West, which you couldn't fly all the way down there, but you could fly halfway, marathon. So about, you know, after we'd been in the plane for a little bit, I was scared to death to fly, flying in planes anyway. And about halfway down, halfway down there, he stops to get gas. Can you imagine? You're supposed to check all that before you ever leave the airport. So then a, that place was closed. We had to go back up in the air again and land at another little airport. And now, my Lord, by that time, I was just scared to death. And so then uh, on our way back, we made it, thank God. And on our way back, we are... Um, we're landing. He said, oh, Betty, he said, I'm videoing everything. Everybody's, he still got, well, he did have the video of it. But when we were landing, we are just doing this. That air, 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 airplane is just doing that. And uh, he said, Betty, he said, I got to go back up again. I said, oh, my God, Glenn. Oh, my God, Glenn, I can't believe this. And I dropped the camera, but it's still videoing everything, my voice and everything, me screaming and hollering. And he flies up and has to land again. Well, then the next time I see him at the next meeting in Jacksonville, that's after he'd had the plane crash with Brother Brown. And he's, I mean, I, that's when I could see. And he's just cracking up, coming towards me. And I went, it ain't funny, Johnny Bud. <laughs> and so he says, but Betty, he said, they say any landing that you can walk away from is a good landing. <laughs> I said, that ain't funny at all. Because Brother Brown never would get back on the plane with him either. <laughs> All right, so y'all didn't move like I want y'all to move. <laughs> That's in my notes. <laughs> oh, now what I want to tell my my niece, my niece and great niece, they went to the tractor supply. And picked up a little bitty ba some little bitty baby chicks because I want this to go along with what I'm talking on. And so they got three, and so they decided to go back and get three more. You could only get three at a time. And so they went back to get three more. 
So there's one chick still left in the pen. So when my great niece got up, they got up to pay for them. She kept telling her mom, she said, but mom, there's one chick just left by itself. And she, her mom said, well, I don't know. They just told us we could get three at a time. So we got three. And she said, but mom, no chick left behind. <laughs> so she, they named, I don't remember all the rest of the names, but they named one of them Chick Norris and one, <laughs> one of them Chick Nugget and one of them Chick Kira. <laughs> So that's why I'm going to blend this in with our sisters. No chick left behind. So that's what I want our sisters to realize. You know, if you see a sister of ours at a meeting sitting by herself, if that, that sister, if I don't know them sitting beside me, I'm finding out who they are, where they're from, how many kids they got. And of course, Glenn always says you can stand at the grocery store line, and I know all about that lady before I check out. And I said, yep, that's what I do. So that's what I want y'all to remember if you see a sister sitting by herself, no chick left behind. So, sister, I'm not even to the part Sister Bud wanted me to talk on. Oh, where's Sister Pam White? Pam White. Was she standing yet? Okay. <laughs> if y'all want to be their bestie, her and Rhonda, just tell them, hey, I was your sister's best friend. And at every meeting, they will look you up and tell you how much that you mean to them. They will tell you how much they love you and appreciate you and just slobber all over you. <laughs> and they are just the sweetest people, but I wanted to tell her how much I appreciate how they've treated me all these years. Their older sister, were, we were good friends. All right, what sister? Oh, 30, I was going to say this one. And there are more benefits because Sister Peach kind of went on this a little bit. But there's 30, 39 benefits of being a minister's wife. Number one, <laughs> you get to eat first. All right, now, Sister, Sister. Uh, Bragg wanted me to talk on funny things that happened in my ministry, in the ministry I've been in. That's all the benefits I come out of in. <laughs> Glenn was called to the... Mi I got some right here. And every now and then I'll take a sip. Thank you, baby. Did I already tell y'all Glenn was called to the ministry when I was 22? I am getting old, so I forget a lot. And I hate it because I get so cold so much, too. And I was going to show y'all my new blouse, but I can't even show you my new blouse. <laughs> one of the first things a sister come up to me in the ministry, I wasn't one of the first of them, but one of them I, I remembered, and it's really not funny to her, but uh, she, uh, she just bawled her eyes out. And she said, Sister Walker, my husband has run around on me. And I said, oh, my Lord. And then she said, she just kept on crying and pouring her heart out. And I went, my Lord. And I called her by her name. I won't call her name. She's still living. And, but she's not going to church. She hadn't been going to church for about 20 years. So I called her name and I said, just kill him and tell God he died. But I said, hey, wait, wait, wait. She goes, Sister Walker. And I said, wait, 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 wait. You probably need to talk to Brother Walker. <laughs> he has a little more godly counsel than I have. <clears throat> then at the church, when we were in Tampa, and this brother has already passed, so I can say something about this. I won't call his name either. Um, we had a weight class. Well, you know. We had the carpet in the dining room, and in the kitchen it was linoleum, so I'd put the scales right inside the kitchen so everybody could weigh every week. And we'd get a dollar if we lost a pound. We had to pay a dollar. And no, we'd have to pay a dollar every week, so everybody that was in that club paid a dollar. And so at the end of six weeks, whoever won the, lost the most weight got to win the prize. 
Well, this one brother, he come in the kitchen. He's working in the kitchen. It was their day to work. And he saw them scales, and he just kicks them like that, kicks them onto the carpet. And I, he had done that several times. So I walked up to him. I said, brother, I said, please don't kick those scales. Those are expensive. And um, he said, I didn't kick those scales. And I went, well, they went from the, <laughs> the, the linoleum to the carpet, you know. And so that's all that was said. And so I went back to the white class. And um, so after church, Brother Walker called me in his office. <laughs> Ever been called into the pastor's office? <laughs> so he said, Betty, you don't want Brother so-and-so to quit church, do you? And I said, no, I really don't. And he said, well, you're going to have to apologize to him. And I said, what did I do, Glenn? And he said, Betty, you know what you did. <laughs> so after church, uh, and I didn't want him to leave church. I mean, that was one of them times that I had to really pray on to like that brother. But um, I didn't want him to leave church. So I, I asked him, I said, would you please forgive me? I probably I shouldn't have said anything to you. And about an hour and a half later, he's still gnawing on me. So I said, could you hold that thought? I've got to go take care of something, and I'll be right back. Well, you know, I just couldn't help it. I couldn't go back. So anyway, <clears throat> that was. I was talking to Sister Martin, Rachel Martin, before church, telling about something one of my girls had done when, she was little, and so um, we tried to stop that. And then, of course, I'm, I've been in here since I was three years old. So some of some, you know, I've been around a few years. Now I haven't learned a lot, you know, but I have been around. So, like, so in my twenties, you know, Glenn and I were still getting adjusted to each other. And you know, I, I know none of y'all went through that, but we were getting adjusted. So. And Shirley, we'd argue all the way to church sometimes. And then as soon as we'd get to the parking lot, we'd open them doors and say, Hey, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So I was just telling Sister Rachel before church, one of my girls one time, uh, Rachel, and that we was poor, they was poor. We'd go over to their house and eat beans, and they'd come over to our house and eat beans. And so then um, one time Rachel said, You know, we got our, we got our, and this was years, 50 years ago. We got our income tax money, and we are not going to, we are just going to blow it. We're just going to have fun. We're just not even going to pay our bills now. We're just going to blow it. And I, of course, in Sunday school, it's so on the way home. I said, Glenn, I said, Rachel told me that they were just going to blow their income tax money and, and not uh, pay their bills. And I said, they're not going to have any money left. They're not going to be able to eat very good. And so... Tammy in Sunday school, Rachel's her, oh, I wasn't going to say her name. <laughs> I have two daughters, so I could have blamed on either one. Anyway, Tammy in Sunday school says, Sister Martin, my mama said. <laughs> so after that experience, and then us arguing on the way to church, I decided we shouldn't do this in front of our kids anymore. So I learned that. And my girls are, no, I don't talk to this day. And uh, they'll come ask me a question about somebody they've heard about. And um, they'll say, I'll say, you know I'm not going to say a word. And they say, I, I know you're not going to say a word. So they'll just walk off. But that's the way we should be, to be in the, being in the ministry. Any mother should be that way. I, I just took me a little bit longer to learn. Oh, when a sister asked you to go talk to the pastor... Make sure you find out what that's about before you go talk to him. When I went, somebody asked me to go, somebody asked me to go talk to Brother Patton with them. I didn't know what they were going to talk about. I said, sure. I just thought she was scared to go talk to him. So we sitting there, and so she was asking him about, and she was disagreeing with something he taught. And he looked at me, and I went, hmm. I had no idea this woman was going to bring this up. I'm out of here, and got up and left. So always make sure you know what you're going to go talk to Brother Patton about or your pastor. Oh, and one thing Brother Patton used to always talk about, 
in Houston, he said, you know, somebody can't make you mad. The madness is already there. So my favorite thing was to go walk up to Glenn and say, he'd say, you make me so mad, Betty. Now, like I said, this was 50 years ago. We've come a long way. <laughs> I said, Brother Patton said, the madness is already there, Glenn. <laughs> yeah. I don't make you mad. The madness was already there. So I enjoyed doing that. Oh, and one of our sisters in the church down there, and they've all both passed away. Um, her husband was dying. He was so chinchy, giving her money. Just aggravates the snot out of me. Uh, I'm here, this man was totally rich, and he would not give his wife hardly anything. And so I said, so he, was, he, had had, he was dying. So he's in a coma, so he didn't know nothing. So I said, I'll tell you what, Sister So-and-so. I said, I'm going to hold the checkbook up, and you're going you're gonna to take his hand, and you're going to write you out a check. Because <laughs> he had seven kids, so them seven kids was going to get most everything. And so I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold this checkbook up, and you're going to fill out this check. So you'll have some money. She said, oh. She said, then that's horrible. Oh, Sister Walker, I just can't do that. And I said, well, why not? Anyway, that's something for y'all not to do. <laughs> we had a brother that got up in our church here a while back, and they gave me permission to tell this, but it's funny. It didn't happen to me, but I said, yes. You know, he said they were driving around somewhere, and they just got married, and she was arguing about something, telling him something. He said, look, I'm the head of this house. And she said, well, I tell you what, you're not at the house right now. We're in the car. (laughs) (laughs) And we had a sister in our church that come into church, and she'd already been in the body, but they'd come back after seven or eight years. And, um, I mean, I just did everything with her, loved her, and and went everywhere with her. And I was over there at their house all the time trying to really win them back to the Lord. And so then her sister-in-law comes in church about six, seven months later. And uh, I told her, I said, you're going to have to get out of the high chair now, honey. I got to take care of this next sister, your sister-in-law. I got to take care of her. You've got to get out of the high chair. And she said, okay, okay. She just still clung to me like this. I couldn't have hardly do anything with her sister-in-law because she was right there with me. I said, I told you, you got to get out of the high chair. I've got to take care of your sister-in-law now. And she just still right there in my face the whole time. So I finally said, Rebecca Rhodes Phillips, (laughs) get out of the high chair. It's time for Patty Rhodes to get in the high chair. And then the other day we were sitting at a table and I was, uh, now this happened just the other day, so this is something that happened the other day. <laughs> I'm just sitting there and Glenn said, what's wrong? And I said, oh, I'm just being quiet, nothing's wrong. And uh, um, he said, well, that's not like you. He said, something must be bothering you. I said, no, nothing's bothering me. And uh, I said, well, i tell you what, I just want to be more like you. And he said, that ain't going to happen, Betty. <laughs> he said, you're not like me, and you can't be like me. You're you, and you talk. And I said, yeah, but so the Lord gave me a song. Not then. He'd give me a song years ago. It's, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like him. So that's my motto now. So I want to be like Glenn. I want to be like him. I want to sing his praises. I want to make it in. So, so I'm trying to be more like Glenn. Honest to God, if I could just be more like him, I could be more like Jesus. <laughs> God help us. Oh, and then I got permission from my husband to say this. Some of y'all, you know, I know it's country music. And, uh, but back in the 60s, you know, my daddy never, we didn't have a radio in our room. And, 
And so um, I never got to listen to the worldly music, except when I'd be in a carload of gospel assembly girls. <laughs> and they'd have the radio on the rock music in the 60s, which that was, you could understand every word they said in those songs back then. So they kind of got stuck in your mind, but then after a while, you know, you still have to work on things. That's probably been 56, seven years ago. So when I quit listening to get, riding in the car with them, well, then I had, was at home and I got my own radio. Well, I kind of started listening to a little bit of country. I never could sing the whole song, but it, just the phrase. You know, like one time I come in the front door, say, this was probably 30 years, 35, 40 years ago, whenever that song come out. I know y'all have heard it because you've been in a restaurant when it's come on, so I know you've heard it. Uh, just a swinging. <laughs> and that's, that's about all I got, you know, of the song. You're, he said, Betty, I come in the front door singing that song. He said, Betty, where in the world did you get that song? And I said, I was trying on a dress at the store, and that was just to play him. And that's all I got was just that part right there. So I said, you know, that sticks in your mind. And, uh, and so uh, sometimes when I started going through things, when we become pastor and pastor's wife at the church, I would never say nothing. But in my mind, these songs would come back to my mind. You know, somebody would be chewing, chewing on you, and you would just be sitting there thinking, you got to know when to hold them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Know when to fold them, know when to walk away. <laughs> Boy, girl, you better run this time. <laughs> That's just what got to my mind. I can't help it. Um, <laughs> then there was the times, sometimes they'd be real nice to you, and a couple of weeks ago, by, and here we go again. Uh, and it wouldn't be like that, and so I, that song would come to my mind. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> supposed to be he's back in town. she's back in town again so it's like she was she'd come back so then the last one was sometimes it'd be you know that song I fought the law and the law won I know y'all have heard it sorry it's just a catchy tune so you've heard it so as I'd say I fought the devil and the devil won so that that like that sister won that that thing Oh, and then uh, I've been there all my life in Houston uh, since I was three. So um, you get you, you don't ever get used to Brother Brown talking to Brother Brown. So here he'd come down the aisle, you know, when in my, my thirties, I think, the last time I did that, he'd come down the aisle, and I went, well, I wonder if I'm gonna speak to him this time, or if I'm not gonna speak to him this time. And uh, it's uh, sometimes he'd speak to you, sometimes he would. Nothing against you. That's just Brother Brown. So I'd say, nah, I'm not going to speak this time. So he'd say, Betty. So I'd say, good Lord. And so then I'd say, hi, Brother Brown. And so the next time I said, I'm going to speak to him this time. And he'd, I'd say, hey, Brother Brown. And he'd not speak a word to me. Didn't even, it, it thought that I'd even said anything. So that was one of my experiences with Brother Brown. I could tell you some more, but I won't, so I'll save that to next time. <laughs> Sorry, counseling with Brother Brown was fun. So I won't, I won't talk about that right now. I had this one sister, and I had to, really, I had to teach some of the sisters in the church even how to deal with her. she just come up, and I know one time I was teaching piano. I was teaching 20 people to play the piano, the beginning stages of piano, and, um, they would be late. I mean, most of them would be late all the time, so they'd be 30, 40 minutes late running to the next one. And So I told Glenn, I said, what do I do? These sisters are just not showing up on time. He said, charge them, start charging them. So I charged them $5, a 30-minute lesson. Well, I mean, they all quit, you know, <laughs> except four. And I think, yeah, I still have two of those on the piano section. But, but um, this one sister... She come up before church and just went to chewing me out for charging her five dollars for a lesson, and I, <clears throat> I tried to explain to her what happened. My brother Walker thought I needed to charge, and so, <clears throat> but it, she just kept chewing me out, kept chewing me out, 
And so then finally, you know, one day she she told me she didn't like the Sunday school teacher we had. And if I didn't change that Sunday school, which I didn't have charge of that anyway, uh, if I didn't change Sunday school teachers, that she was going to take our kids out of Sunday school. And I said, well, let me talk to Brother Walker about that, and I'll get back with you. So I talked to him, and he said, let her take our kids out of Sunday school, you know. So I, I just said, well, I'm, Brother Walker said we can't change the Sunday school teacher, so we're going to leave it like it is. So, I mean, just every time you saw her coming, you knew she was fixing to chew you up. So I got to where when I walked down the aisle, I, you know, you still have to be the right kind of pastor's wife. You still have to treat them like, like everybody else. So, but I, I, I got it, and it took care of everything. So I walked past and say, hey, what's up? How y'all been doing? Kept walking. I never would stop and talk to him. She testified that God had changed Sister Walker so much. She was just tickled to death that the Lord had dealt with Sister Walker to change her. Well, on the other hand, I had other sisters coming to me. How do we deal with this? How do we deal with her chewing us out all the time? And I said, what you do is when she walks up and says, I want to talk to you. And that's how she'd do I want to talk to you. She'd say, and I'd say, tell her, hey, hang on just a minute. And the closest person to you, call them over there and say, as soon as sister so-and-so gets through talking to me, I am going to, I want to ask you a question. So you turn to her and she'd say, oh, never mind. I'll just talk to you later. So that always took care of her from then on. You have to have a lot of God, godly wisdom to take care of all that. I'm almost through, y'all. Oh, when I was in Houston, so this was when I was real young, Brother Patton divided the church up into groups. And so, um, you know, when, when we'd have a funeral, we'd have a dinner. This, just this one sister would always do this. I'd say, could you bring some corn for the funeral? She would bring a can of corn and set it on the counter. So then we would have a dinner, and she would, she'd look around. She said, I knew y'all didn't need my food, so I left it at home. Of course, Brother Walker said, Betty, you go tell that sister to go home and get her food. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do this because she was a, this was in Houston, and she was a chewer out, chewer out or two. So I didn't feel like facing that. So that's, those are some of the people you come against, come, come across. I'm sorry, come across. So, I, But I did learn to tell that sister. I said, could you at least bring enough corn for 10 people, please? So, <laughs> so I got that fixed. And then one time, Glenn had, Glenn had talked on uh, suffer yourself to be defrauded. You know what that means. When somebody, uh, somebody thinks you did them wrong, and you know you didn't do them wrong, you just keep your mouth shut. You don't, you don't try to tell your side of the story. You don't, you don't say anything back. You just, please forgive me and, and go on. You know, it's, that's a lot. Of, everybody's talking on forgiveness. Now, you just say, please forgive me and don't go on. So on a Sunday, um, we always had people on diets in the church. Of course, I was on a diet then. But, you know, I, I had brains. I did not go around telling them what I can eat and what I can't eat and what the kitchen head and what I can eat and what I can't. But this other sister, all the time, she'd go through the line. She'd say, I can't eat that. I can eat that. I can't eat that. But I never would do that. So one day I went in the kitchen just for something. And so this one sister walked up to me and said, uh, said uh, I don't appreciate the way you do us, telling us what you can eat and what you don't eat. I said, I don't think I do that. You know, and I said, if I do, I'm sorry, but I don't do that. And she just kept on and kept on. And this other person come up and started doing the same thing. So, whew, I partied for a while. So anyway, we went, uh, somebody come to the door, so I walked out. Well, then... This one lady's husband wasn't there that day. So the next time at, Bible, at prayer meeting, she come up to me and she said, "What? Ha my husband told me what happened Sunday. I said, well, what happened Sunday? So she went to tell me about it. And, and uh, well, she didn't tell me about it. She said, well, he told me. I said, okay, well, good. I'm glad he told you. And so she said, what did happen? I said, hmm, it wasn't, wasn't no big deal. It was Okay. And she said, no, I want, I want to hear it from you, what happened. And I said, really, it was no big deal. I mean, you know, we're all cool now. So she kept on and kept on. I said, well, maybe I just need to tell her what happened. 
So I went, proceeded to tell her what happened. And all the way out the door, she's going, you know, to let me know. She didn't believe a word I just said. So I learned real fast on how you're supposed to suffer yourself to be defrauded. So anyway, I think that's it. So I appreciate y'all letting me talk, but I have one more thing. What three things do you bring to the uh, house of God? In your wallet. I, whoops, did I say that? Uh, I learned this from another ladies' meeting I was just at a few months ago. And I thought it was the neatest idea, and I got permission to do this. And this probably won't be funny, but I got permission to do this, and... Uh, who all doesn't love Shirley Bragg? There's nobody that doesn't love Shirley Bragg. She is a sweetheart. Does she need money? Mm, she could always use it. You know, like me, you know, in the back of my head, there's something I'd like to have. And, you know, um, maybe it cost a couple hundred dollars, you know. So I just put my little money back till I get it saved. And, you know, people in the church in Lakeland have learned me. They say they give me money. And they say, Sister Walker, you cannot give this money to anybody. You have to spend it on yourself. So I have to put that money back. You know, because the mother of the church, you walk down the aisle and you hear people talking. You hear people talking, I lost my job this week. And, you know, I just keep going. I don't go back and say, oh, my God, you lost your job. But I hear it. So I know who's going to need money this next week. So I always give it to them. And um, like the other night, I knew this young man's really going through something, and we have fellowship after church. We have a fundraising for the youth, a fundraising for the church, fundraising for the whoever's a senior in our church graduating that year. We have fundraising for them on Saturday night after church. So I knew him and his son wanted a fellowship, and so I said, here's $20. I said, I want you to have it. And I said, no, I don't always have it. And nobody gave me this money. It's just, well, Brother Walker gives it to me every so often. He gives me money. So I give his money away. Now, he knows it goes somewhere. But, but anyway, I would like to take up an offering for Sister Bragg just so she could have some money to buy something special that she wants. So I asked Sister Amy to make sure I had a basket. And so before we... Uh, before this is over with, well, right now, so everybody get their wallets out, billfolds, coin purses, and then we're going to pass this. Somebody, if somebody will come, pass this around for me. I was hoping we'd have two, but this will probably do it real fast. Here comes a young man. Thank you. All right, and if y'all would just... Please, let's all give what we can to Sister Bragg and show her how much we appreciate her doing this and uh, loving us so much. Oh. Probably have to have somebody take over. She wants me to sing something. Um. You are my brother, you are my sister, and I need together in sunshine, together in rain, and I need you. I can't make it all by myself. I need your love, your strength, and your praise and when we walk through those great pearly gates i'll be glad i said you oh you are my brother you are my sister and i need you i can't remember it all together in sunshine to get, I need y'all. <laughs> and I can't make it all.
I appreciate y'all giving to Sister Brad because we love her so much. And if you don't remember anything I said today, remember, no chick left behind. I admire the sisters that can uh, come up here and just talk. But I'm, I have to have my notes because I'll forget. But um, I appreciate being here, uh, Sister Bragg. I guess I got to know you better a couple years ago. Um, we went thrifting together and uh, had a nice time. And, and I appreciate your friendship. And Sister McClure, um, she has treated us well, her and Brother McClure in their home, and we appreciate that. Uh, she called a few, uh, probably about six weeks ago, four weeks ago, and asked if I would uh, speak in this meeting. Um, many of you know me, and um, this is a little difficult for me at times to get up and talk, but she uh, asked if, Sister Bragg asked her to ask if I would speak and pass along some experiences as a pastor's wife. And uh, Sister Peach, I've appreciated her words, and Sister Walker, uh, Sister Peach encouraged me that I could do this, and Sister Walker makes me feel good that I can. And uh, so here we are. Uh, but several years ago, Sister Jones, in one of our meetings, uh, gave a talk, and one of her statements she mentioned 
uh, in spite of our shortcomings, after all, we are all overcomers, overcoming, not just pastors' wives or sisters in the church. There have been many stresses, but there's been far more blessings. Uh, they outweigh the stresses as being a pastor's wife or a sister in the church. Uh, like many of you in this room have had many experiences along the way. Um, I'll just kind of go back. Sister Peach was recounting the years that she had been a pastor's wife and Sister Walker. Uh, I was a little bit later. Um, I was 38 uh, years old when my husband was called to the ministry to go to Birmingham. So there's been a lot of experiences along the way. Um, I couldn't tell all of them. I wouldn't tell all of them. Uh, but it's been, it's been a good life, and I appreciate it. I've had many mentors along the way in this room that have helped me. And I'll just kind of go back the past 29 years when we got started, before we went to Birmingham. After much prayer and fasting, my husband answered the call to go to Birmingham uh, to pastor the church there in November of 1995. And uh, we moved there and made our physical move on April the 26th, 1996. And we've been privileged to be in the church there in Birmingham for 29 years and to work with a wonderful group of people. They're precious to us, both of us, and uh, they've enriched our lives working with them. I think they've taught us more than we have taught them. Uh, we were fairly young when we went there. I was 38, and my husband was uh, 41, I think. But going back, uh, both of us were working. Um, I'll have to refer back to my notes because I need them. But um, we both were working public jobs, and uh, Brother Sharper would go to Birmingham on the weekends to be in service there, and I didn't always get to go with him. Uh, Mondays were stressful at my work, so I always didn't get to go be there with him, and he would come back um, on Sundays to prepare for the next week. But one, he did this for about a year and a half, and one particular weekend he had been in a meeting in Florida, and on the way back he stopped there at Birmingham and uh, went into the parsonage there for a week, not telling anybody so that he could fast and pray and get an answer from the Lord. And I was up still at home there, and he called the night uh, to let me know that he had gotten an answer from the Lord that he had been called to go to Birmingham. And on the other end of the phone, I went silent um, and um, sat there probably, it seemed like, for five minutes. And he finally asked me, are you there? And I said, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. But as a woman, I began to think of the natural things that would happen during, is that too loud? The natural things that would take place. Close, okay. The natural things that would take place is leaving our uh, church family that we were there working by their sides and working in many areas of the church. And then, of course, our natural family. And my husband had just built us a new home himself, my dream home. I knew I'd be leaving that, but that's just a natural thing. But I was uh, beginning to feel a little guilty on the other end of the line because he had felt the calling. Uh, I was happy and thankful that he got the answer that he needed, but I was also fearful. And then, uh, as I said earlier, the saints in the Springville Assembly are precious to my husband and myself. We've appreciated working with them there, and we have a lot of many, many wonderful memories. And I was thinking about the many blessings that we've had watching them. Many had received the Holy Ghost. Many have renewed their walk with the Lord, and then watching them grow over the years. Uh, some of them were like two and three years old when we went there, and now they have their own families. And to get to watch them raise their children in the church and to nurture them along in the things of the Lord has been such a blessing. And uh, we've got to watch them grow spiritually and naturally in their lives, and we appreciate that. But some of the stresses... That's some of the blessings that we receive as pastor's wife is watching the ones in the church. But some of the stresses is watching them have to be hurt uh, to grow in the Lord. Our husbands have to sometimes deal with situations, and it hurts to watch them. But they have to have that to grow at times. We all have to have that to grow. 
And then uh, when I went there, I asked the Lord uh, if he would help me to be sensitive to the needs of the people, sensitive to their feelings, sensitive to their hopes, and sensitive to their fears, and to, and to please give me a love for them. And he has. Um, I appreciate the love that the Lord has allowed me to have for the saints there in the church and to also keep a tenderness as years go by and experiences uh, sometimes can harden us a little. But I've asked the Lord to please keep a tenderness in my heart. And I read a statement not long ago that uh, an inner joy and peace to those whose walk has brought them close to the heart of God they experience calm when there is not a reason for it. They know a peace that bypasses the mind and goes straight to the heart. They know who they are in Christ, and they rejoice to see God's kingdom increase rather than their own. And like I said, I would, uh, it's been a great honor uh, to work beside my husband in the Lord's service, watching him fulfill God's plan through him. Uh, in one of the Martin, uh, in one of the songs that Sister Martin, I don't know if she's here, wrote that uh, in one of the verses, and I can't even remember the name of the song right now. But in this days we're living in, the way you speak, Lord, is through men. And I was thinking that uh, the Lord does speak through our husbands, and uh, I was thinking about how many people there are in the world. I don't know what is the how many. What's the population? And to think that. Uh, when you put that in perspective and think that the Lord called your husband out of all of those people to do his service, and then someone was talking, uh, I guess it was Sister Peach, when the Lord calls your husband, uh, when he called your husband to the ministry, he knew who he was married to. So we were called, Sister Peach, uh, not the same calling, but he knew when he called him who he was married to. And uh, I'm thankful to be a part of this. Uh, and first, I'd like to say, uh, before I go any further, I don't feel like I'm authority on this. There's so many more in this room that uh, can offer so much more. But I just wanted to pass along some of the experiences that I was asked to do. And uh, one thing I'd like to say, I have a great respect, respect for my husband and his ministry. And the congregation there in Springville knows that. And uh, the one thing that I always, always remember, he's a pastor and I'm not. Uh, so I always keep that when I have a little opinion. I always want to realize I'm not the pastor he is. Uh, and I'll go back. Uh, when we first moved to uh, Birmingham and uh, left our jobs, our homes, and uh, it was probably a couple weeks in to being there. Uh, I woke up one night crying uh, so hard. I guess the whole room must have been shaking. But my husband asked me, he said, honey, what's, what's wrong with you? Uh, and I couldn't stop crying. And uh, this is just some of the things you go through as a woman. Uh, uh, the statement that I made, and he still ref uh, reflects back to it sometimes because it was a memorable moment. But I said, I, I don't have a home. I don't have a job. I said, uh, I said, I don't even have a driver's license in the state. I said, what, what have we done? Uh, the reality had hit me. And um, he said, honey, we have done it. We're doing what God has asked us to do. And uh, that comforted me at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, but my husband and I have always had a, a good communication. He's my best friend. I have no other best friend. My husband is my best friend, and we communicate well. Um, we have a communication, and uh, I ran across an article many, several years ago, and I've used it at one of our meetings, but the title of it is, Oh, to be eight again. A man was sitting on the edge of his bed watching his wife, who was looking at herself in the mirror. Since her birthday was not far off, he asked, what she'd like to have for her birthday. I'd like to be eight again, she replied, still looking in the mirror. On the morning of her birthday, he arose early, made her a nice big bowl of Cheerios or Cocoa Pops, and then he took her to Adventure World theme park 
What a day. He put her on every ride in the, in the park, the death slide, the wall of fear, the screaming roller coaster, everything that was there he put her on. Five hours later, they staggered out of the theme park. Her head was reeling and her stomach felt upside down. He then took her to McDonald's where he ordered her a Happy Meal with extra fries and a chocolate shake. Then it was off to the movies, which we don't get. He was off to the movies, popcorn and a slushie, and her favorite candy, M&M's. What a fabulous adventure. Finally, she wobbled home with her husband and collapsed in the bed, exhausted. He leaned over to his wife with a big smile and lovingly asked, Well, dear, what was it like to be eight again? Her eyes slowly opened and her expression changed suddenly. I meant my dress size. So <laughs> they didn't, they weren't communicating, but my husband and I communicate well. i just put that in. But anyway. Um, then there's, then there's communications uh, with the saints in the church. Uh, this was an example that happened to a sister years ago, one of the pastor's wives, and she passed this along to me. Uh, one of the sisters asked, um, the, they were going shopping, they were going on a shopping trip. So the sister asked the pastor's wife, said, uh, wanted to know if sister so-and-so could go. Well, she answered, um, I don't care if she goes. That sister took it that she didn't want that sister to go. So she told that sister. But we all have different ways of expressing ourselves. She meant that she didn't care if she went. But that was took wrong. That was a lack of communication. So we try to always be aware of what we're saying. And then there's, uh, I wrote down a few things. There's a listening ear. Uh, oh, if I guess it's a few months ago, a dear sister gave this to me, and I keep it in our kitchen, and it is very handy because I think probably many of you all have done this, but I keep it right on my, you just nod and smile sometimes is all that you can do, but she got, uh, Sister Peach gave that to me. We have a thing about smiles, but uh, sometimes we can just nod and smile uh, Sometimes when somebody comes to you or me or whoever, they're not really wanting any uh, answer. They're just wanting a listening ear. And sometimes we uh, just have to nod and smile and listen. And then there's sometimes uh, someone will ask a question. Um, and I know many, many of you have experienced this. We have to weigh the questions that they ask us because sometimes uh, are they asking that question out of sincerity or is that question being asked just because they want to be in the know about something? Uh, and sometimes even if the question is sincere that they're asking, uh, we're not, we don't have the privilege to answer everything that we're asked. I think that's been brought up. We don't have the privilege to do that but always wanting to be gracious uh, because we don't want to hurt anyone. Uh, never want to hurt anyone. And uh, there was a statement many years ago, you know, people, they may not remember what we did for them and they may not remember what we said to them, but they're always going to remember how we made them feel. And uh, so we don't want to hurt anyone. Um, I hope this is what you were looking for. But anyway, the next thing is not any particular order. Uh, our time is not always ours. Um, another statement. We accept the fact, uh, Sister Jones made this statement in a talk many years ago. We accept the fact that the work of the Lord and the needs of the saints are the first and we are second. Not second placed, just second. That's part of our calling. And... Um, Let's see, and then there's many hours um, that happens in anyone's home. There's many hours that you're called in the night um, to take care of particular things. I have, uh, I'll share a personal experience. Many years ago, my husband had to go out for most of the day with another brother. 
So someone was talking about, you know, we have to help our husbands. We have to take care of them. And uh, so this particular day, I thought, well, he'll be gone all day, and I'll fix him a, a nice meal. So I did the whole, um, there's some brothers back here, so anyway. But anyway, I fixed him a nice meal and uh, had the tablecloth and the candles and uh, tried a new recipe and had it all ready and uh, set a nice table. And right before um, he was to come home, he called. And there was a brother that was in need, and he needed to come with him to the house for him to counsel with him. So not wanting to hurt that brother, because you could tell what was taking place there, uh, I took it all down and put it away. So sometimes we have to expect the unexpected, and that's just the way it is, and it's all right. There's always going to be interruptions. Um, sometimes Brother Sharp will have to, when Brother Sharp counsels any of the sisters in the church, I'm present. I'm always there in the room with him. Uh, and almost all the couples that he counsels, I'm in the room with him. Uh, he provides a spiritual shoulder for them to cry on, and I'm there to provide the natural one. There's times uh, when a sister needs to talk about. There's times when a sister needs to um, talk about things that she's not comfortable talking to Brother Sharber about, and they would expect of me there. Excuse me. There's been 12 pastors in Birmingham, and several pastors' wives before me when we went there. The saints there knew more about being a pastor's wife than I did. They had many more experiences than I had. And they were always kind and still are kind to me and gracious. They taught us a lot. My previous pastor's wives were great mentors. I felt very inadequate. They had so many wonderful qualities. I had one pastor's wife that was, she was a scriptorian. I'm not. Uh, she could quote scripture. She could teach Bible classes. I was trying to compare myself with that. I can't do that, and I still don't. Um, I wondered if I would ever, ever measure up to the way that had been. Uh, we, can, uh, we can become a prisoner of someone else's expectations, and we can be a prisoner of our own expectations. In one of my first pastor's wife's meeting, a statement was made, you always keep your place, the one the Lord gave you, because if you don't, there are others who would like to. My husband and I have always had a close relationship, as I said. Well, he's my best friend. I know, I know there's no one else wanting the place I feel as his wife, but there might be times when others might feel that they would do things differently if they were the pastor's wife. And I want to keep my place, and I don't want to ever hinder the things that my husband's doing. And I always remember God put him in the place he's in. I've got an article that a dear sister uh, many years ago, she was a great mentor to me, and I still miss her. Sister Betty Langley, um, she read it many years ago, and I was a new pastor's wife, needing uh, much direction, much Correction and much assurance, and at these meetings, even at our age now, I'm 69. Uh, even at our age now, we all need assurance. We all need assurance so that we can help the sisters in the church. So this article, even after 29 years, comes back to me at different times, and uh, I'll wear it. I'll, anyway, I'll read it. The name of it is "Wear Your Own Shoes," and I I hope this will help some of the younger pastor's wives that are coming along because it has really helped me. It says, once when my husband accepted the pastorate of a church, he followed a man who had been there for 17 years. And I often think we've been there 29 years. Um, what's going to be said of me after we're gone? But uh, he was loved and respected by so many in the congregation and also in the town. 
People sometimes even called me by his wife's name. Has that ever happened to anybody? And at almost every meeting of the ladies, her name was finally mentioned. I began to wonder if I could fill her shoes. Because I wanted to be accepted by the congregation, I would pray. Sister Peach talked about prayer is one of the main things. There has to be much prayer in this. I would pray asking the Lord to let his spirit flow through me. Then I realized that what I really wanted was for the Lord to let me take up where she had left off and to use me exactly the way he had used her. I had tried before to wear the spiritual shoes of another, but not with the same strong determination I felt this time. That lady had been a woman of prayer, self-denial, self-discipline, and sensitivity to the Lord's direction. Was it right for me to expect her to leave those shoes behind for me? As a child, I had heard people talk about their shoes hurting their feet because their shoes weren't broken in yet. It was because her shoes were the wrong size. Poorly fitted shoes can cause a lot of misery. Gradually, I realized that it was in trying to wear another's shoes which did not fit. I was becoming a spiritual cripple. No matter how hard I tried or how much I prayed, I could not be just like the former pastor's wife. Patiently, the Lord kept trying to direct my steps in another direction. I felt as if my spiritual escalator was going up and I was walking backward on it. I wasn't accomplishing much for the Lord. Proverbs 12, 25. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. I know that's not the King James, but my heart was heavy. It was stooped with frustration. I wanted some confirmation of acceptance from the people. So I continued to ask the Lord to give me the same gifts he had given her. By the time, I'm not sure what denomination this was, but by the time our district superintendent and his wife came for my husband's installation service as pastor, I was ready to talk. I shared my feelings with the superintendent's wife. The Lord gave her words of wisdom for me. She said, you cannot be that person and God does not expect you to be. Be yourself and allow God to use you in the way he wants you. It was such a simple statement, fitly spoken. I hadn't been thinking so much about what he wanted me to be, but what I wanted and what I thought would bring me favor with my husband's congregation. Her words meant the difference between victory and defeat for my usefulness to the Lord in the future at that church. From that time forward, I began wearing the shoes God designed for me. Wearing my own shoes instead of someone else's that didn't even fit me. I could now stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. I could also walk and run for the Lord. As I allowed the Lord to use my life in his own way, I found fulfillment and acceptance. Our talents and abilities differed differ, but God does not play one person against another. He has given to every man severally as he wills. Though our gifts are different, the source is the same and for the same purpose, the edification of the body of Christ. And I just thought that was a, a wonderful article. Uh, I don't know where Sister Langley got that at, but it has helped me even today uh, because I know there's many sisters in this room that have many more abilities in different areas than I do, but I can give what I can give. And uh, I guess I'm referring to the Brother Sister Jones, but at your meeting, Sister Jones, Brother Jones, I don't know if I'm making this statement just right. He said, you may out-preach me. Uh, you may be able to quote many more scriptures, but you can't out-love me. And uh, God has given a great love for this people, and I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, there's another area uh, someone had talked about is conflict and misunderstanding, and that's all that's going to happen. We are, all, <coughs> excuse me, we are always in much prayer, as I said early, in the needs of the people. 
some need some needs drive us to our knees more than others and uh, just for a little example uh, and I'm sure many of you have this in your home uh, I literally have a prayer closet um, and I go to that many times uh, I have the bench there and it is literally in my closet but uh, some needs drive you to your knees more than others and it takes much much prayer much prayer There's times when our pastor husband has to deal with certain situations, and I know it's hard on him, but it's a necessary part for the for all of us. I'm a saint in the church. I'm not just a pastor's wife. I'm a saint in the church, and uh, we all need things to help us grow. And uh, another area uh, is not trying to show a bad attitude uh, when we hear negative things said about our husband, and which we will which we will, um, that's always been. But I was reading the other day in Isaiah about Jesus and uh, good help. Where do you hear negative things? Even after 29 years, you're going to hear negative things about your husband. Uh, but Jesus was talking about he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And I don't know who he's talking about. That's hard sometimes. You want to express your feelings. Uh, who was talking the other night about your tongue? What was the example that I gave? Okay. Finding the ridge in your tongue. Anyway, they anyway they gave an example. Sometimes you want to say something, but you're not allowed to do that. So there's sometimes there's literally a ridge in your tongue. So you have to find that ridge in your tongue sometimes when we want to say something. Um, and then in Psalms 30, uh, 39, it also says that I help my uh, peace. Try to stay peaceful. Uh, I said I was dumb with silence and help my peace. Try to stay peaceful and. Uh, we don't want anything to rob our peace. I won't go into the situation because it would take too long. It's not really uh, anything about a pastor, pastor's wife, but uh, my husband's medical condition. I almost lost my peace, um, and you don't want to do that. We don't want to lose our peace. We want to keep our peace. Uh, our hus my husband, I'm just going to speak for him. He, he doesn't need me to defend him. Uh, he's plenty capable. He's plenty capable, and he's got the Lord on his side. So that's, I don't need to try to defend him. Uh, and then, uh, don't want to be moody. I, I don't want to go in moody at every service. I heard about a man on the job that every day that he went to work, one day he would go in, he was sad. One day he would go in, he was mad. One day he would go in, he was glad. So his uh, boss called him into the office and he said you're going to have to do something pick one of your attitudes and come in with it and we'll know what to expect so we don't want to go in church moody um, let's see this is a personal example many years ago and i'll try to make this short i don't want to talk too long uh, we were living in the church apartment we had company some of those are in the room they may not even known it at the time. Uh, my brother had passed away, so there were several people visiting. Uh, peaches were in, and my husband wanted to go and get them some peaches so they could take them back with them. Well, we had an old truck. It was a 1978 truck, the year we married, and he really liked that truck. So he was going to go pick them peaches, pick them some peaches. So it was early in the morning. I fell back to sleep. The apartment's right by the parking lot of the church. Um, so when I woke up, I woke up to an explosion. Um, I lit you know, I jumped up. I looked out the window. His truck is engulfed in flames. I mean, it's coming out the windows. 
Well, I didn't know how much time had lapsed from the time that he kissed me goodbye to go get peaches. So I thought he was in the truck. Not knowing uh, the truck wouldn't start, so he took the car. To make a long story short, I woke up to an explosion. There was a fire truck out there, police car, people everywhere. I'm thinking he's in the truck. So I jumped up and got on what I could, and I ran down the stairs and was running toward the truck. The policeman had to stop me. Um, but that fear, he was in the truck. So I finally realized the car was gone. The police officer called his phone, and all he could hear was me crying in the background. He said, what's wrong? And he said, your wife thought she was in the truck. But anyway, to make a long story short, he wasn't. Truck burned up, no insurance, it would not. But anyway, I'm in tears. We're going to get ready to go into service. Um, we've got lots of company. So I had to restrain myself. So I was praying, Lord, please let us have a crying service so I can go in and just cry and they won't know what's wrong with me. But anyway, we have to keep our moves steady and sometimes it's not easy. But anyway. Uh, let's see. Okay. And then there's situations in the church, uh, like I said, and I will, the people in Birmingham, I can't imagine. Another statement I heard many preachers years ago, I use it a lot, <laughs> we are all just struggling souls, every one of us, and we all have needs, and we're going to change in time. Like I said, when I went to Birmingham, I was 38 years old, so there's been many seasons in life during those years. I once was young, but I'm older now, so each season brought different things sometimes and our body goes through many changes and I'm sure many of you sisters in this room can relate to that but I always have to remember that whatever season I have in my life that I'm in there's going to be eyes watching us they're always watching Is a God son, and then Sandy White, I'm for that. Continue with the Lord and send us prayer. He did a proper balance between the uh, so my month of Mary this morning. Sometimes it's hard to for me to keep the balance. Um, sometimes I tend to be more of a martyr, so I can get things done. Yes. But we have to keep the proper balance in that because we don't want to get spiritually or naturally pain because that happens in our lives. And then our relationship with our husband, um, I've heard that we always want to keep that fresh and um, new, no matter what age you're following. Sometimes you think we're older, but we have to keep that fresh and new. We try to help with the rest of our lives, and he's the one who is my burden bearer. I'm not. Um, I'm always in prayer for him and always with the same word of support of him. So I have a I'm always supportive of him. And then in relationship with the saints, I'm not keeping our relationship with him. Um, I'm always respecting him and loving him. I'm not. I'm going to tell everybody about it. I'm going to say, my husband's my best friend. I have to know. And I have the best friend, so he's my best friend. And I always remember that about all of them. We're all children of the world. My husband, including me, my husband, 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 I'm going to be here a few times and I'm going to be 
But you know, what did you put the baskets? The baskets, the ones with the money.
recently found her son at the age, you know. <laughs> we did not leave that age before. But we took a leap of faith and we were going to believe it. We prayed and we trusted the Lord. And we didn't understand what everything was happening, but we knew as the Lord knew. A few years after we went to Louisville and we were there to play loss, uh, we had children. And I had three sons. And when I had my first child, this is everything came back strong. You know how when you have a baby, you're like, oh, it's just like your blue eyes, or that one's got my black hair, or her ears look like her right father. It's just, it's just something you do. I think women really, really do that a lot. Uh, but when I was looking at my newborn baby, I remember the feeling the only one of me, and it's like, no. And so this is an evening the Lord started calling me. I had never wanted to pursue the find in my biological family. Um, like I said, I had a good adopted family, and they were my parents. I knew the other parents. But the identity, the thing that most people had in their lives that just come along the line was a family. So I started praying about it. And my husband had not been done with the computer, he had all these searches. Uh, the only thing that we could find was that we had a birth name for hospital. I don't think we had anything for birth name, so we lost our mother. So I thought, well, I've been lost before. I just didn't want to see him. But, you know, I, I started playing about that because it bothered me. And I asked the Lord, would he please intervene here, even when he saw I prayed, this is your huge mission, and then I gave it to the Lord. I said, Lord, maybe it's something that I can't handle. Maybe it's something that's too dark. Maybe it's something good, but I'm going to give it to you, and I'll just deal with my problems. So I think probably five years went by, and I was on vacation, and I found that. And I think I got that, giving that to the Lord. And there was a sister, I don't know the other one. She said, Is this Emily Meek? And I was like, Oh, by that name. And I was like, Who is this? And I was like, oh, It used to be my last name. And it was my first name. And I said, Well, who is this? And she said, She asked about my birthday. She asked about this woman. And then I realized it hit me that the Lord had sent the instruction to my prayer. And I didn't know where it was going to go, but I knew God had heard me. So she said, I'm your sister. I'm your older sister. And she talked to me on the phone a little bit. And then she communicated that I was not an only child. I had 11 siblings. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Lord, do I do this? <laughs> but you're not only child, it's a whole family to see family. So she met me a few times in Louisville. Uh, her husband was coming back and forth with her for some medical needs. And I got to know her. Well, I found that my biological parents were gone. And that was a good thing because I really didn't want to meet my biological parents, but I did want to get to know my biological family. So she and Ray showed me that a whole pizza hut to get this family. It took the whole restaurant here to hang back here. We drove to Hazard, Kentucky. Uh, my family, and then we met all of my brothers and all my sisters, and I saw my buddy that was younger than me, just like my youngest son. It was scary. <laughs> and I was, my son from way over there, he said, Can you carry on the wall? And I said, I'll see that. So we met this next time to be a little curly prayer, and he answered that prayer. But then he was a little better than this. I had an aunt that lived in Hazard, and after I had been at my sister's house, she just begged to meet me. And I, I didn't really want to go, but I kept going, I kept praying for y'all, this it was a lot for me to do. I thought the Lord saying you need to go, and this aunt was my father's cousin's mom. And my uncle was already in the mom, but my aunt was so alive. So my husband's in the restaurant, so we don't have to stay long. We're very healthy and we'll leave. 
Lord, I need your mercies, but I'm really moving. Your grace multiplied, so tears I now cry, the vision brings joy. All of creation speaks a great declaration of your manifold wisdom, such a great orchestration. What a reminder that you're the master designer, the heavens declare. And make me aware of your infinite power. So I'd like to close on those words that I don't have any instructions really to give me. I'm still learning a lot myself. But and I didn't do it on the talks that's been given here today. Just remember if the Lord is talking to your heart, He has a call for your heart. And like I said, it may not be a pastor's call. It could be any other. There's many things that may not provide you advice. I'm going to share that myself. Uh, I'm a shy, super brand, but I'm more common. Uh, I'm simple. I don't talk fancy. <laughs> That's not me. But I'll tell you, uh, I'm from Houston, from Houston, Texas. Um, my mother was raised in, my mother came to body. And I was three years old, and that's the years old too. And uh, that's where I, that's where I grew up at, the in Houston. And uh, <clears throat> when my aunt Foss had come to the body, she, she, uh, Sister Bar invited her. And I come from a, my mother was a family of 15. And uh, <clears throat> four, five of those sisters come to the body. And uh, they all had kids, you know, the church really quick. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, mother, we, she said she used to take us to church, and we was all just stair step, and she lay us in the floor. And my dad didn't come, but I can never remember my mother. Um, they didn't stay home for anything. <coughs> Only when she would let me stay home and said I was on high fever and she had to take it. <laughs> so that tell you anything. <laughs> but <clears throat> as I grew up, um, we had a nice home. I can never remember um, things not being nice. Um, I can never remember not having a, a bedroom without our own bathroom. There's a point to this. Um, my mother always had a new car, my dad always had a new truck. We just had a lot of things for So I never knew what it was like to be without. Boy, did I learn. I learned. But <clears throat> when my husband, um, we were, um, Lord, the Lord made us to survive support. And my husband didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. But part of my family had moved down there. They all started off with um, all the husbands. They had, you know, had saved homes down there. And they were fishermen, hunters, things like that. And uh, of course, the sisters, the poor Marshall sisters, wherever they went, they were going to have church somewhere. And uh, I remember my mother calling. For the pat, and she thought that he would tell her to not go. She said, Look, Pat, my husband wants me to go with him. It's only Saturday night, and I just came to this church. He said, Sister White, at the time she was Sister White, she said, You go with him. I said, He might come back to church with you. So that's how it started. So they started having church. 
And uh, I, we were going back and forth to mom. We was having brother Buddy with mom. And uh, I never, it just didn't cross my mind. I knew my husband was getting up. I knew he had a call. But I just thought we could just sit there. You know, all my family was there. Oh, it was great. We had the lake. We had to go fishing. We could just be with our family. But anyway, um, he uh, called us that night. He, he, he said, I want to talk to you, Shirley. He said, um, George, you know you've got this call in your life, and I didn't know what happens. And I asked him if I could do this. I only see you and Shirley as your dad coaches. And I'm just getting into this house. And then he showed me, I said, I can't go. I don't know what wrong. He said, I haven't done anything else yet. He said, my husband's here, she didn't And I knew then he was going. And we were in the hospital. And when he told us how much we were going to pay, now I come from a father, everything was going to have on his paper. I couldn't even think of that. I said, I can't even think of that. I said, I'm going to go to the hospital. I said, I'm going to go to the hospital. I said, I'm going to go to the hospital. I mean, my mom, I said, George can't do that. He can't do that. He said, Shirley. He just, Shirley. Yeah. My mom said, Shirley. He said, This one time we have always been able to work things out ourselves on everything. Why not give God a chance and trust God? What can you say to that? I knew it was going. And so, I thought, oh, he just talked about it. He said, we're going to, we can do this. So when we got over there, we moved over there, we were talking to the mom, she don't have to be And so we, we went over there, we put a scene that night, we were there for a couple of months. Now, we, our house is not had its sold yet. So, the little guy said, We're not going to live in this little room here. And it was a little room. It was just a little room. Anyway, and it had a bathroom. It had, had a bathroom, that's right. And uh, he said, um, So, things started, you know, he started needing things. Started needing things. And he said, I said, Wes, I was a little boy that was two years old. I said, Wes needs some tennis shoes. I said, what are we going to do? He said, so we're going to pray. You're not going to say a word to nobody, and I'm not going to say a word to nobody. We went to church that night, and we had a visiting brother that came to church. And he said, Brother Brad, I I gotta give this to you, and I don't know what this means, but he said there's only one word that comes to me. He said to me, Jews. From that moment, I didn't remember that was the word. I've never told you. I've always known that you'd be there no matter what, no matter what. And uh, we were sitting where you were dying. My son and I, it seemed like our mom was always sitting in the little, little, little big room. Because so our house was still for sale, on sale. We were sitting there, my husband was out in the dining room. You know, he was having to be quiet. And we were in the door, sleeping at night. For some reason, the rats seemed like it was a roadway up above our heads. They were crazy there. And, uh, I said, I just can't stand that sound anymore. Wes, he said, I've had it wrong. He gets a groove. And it's little squares like that. And he pushes it up, and the rat comes right down. And I jump up on this little table. And I said, I'm going to get this rat. I said, I'm going to get this rat. I said, I'm going to get this rat. I'm going to get this rat. Don't be strong. You did not let these people know what's going on in me. I said, I'm going to get this one. And I'm going to push it out, and you're going to catch it. 
which is now one of the first year. Brother Pat, come up to us and say, Brother George, have y'all sold your house yet? He said, no. He said, um, where, where, are y'all, where, where are y'all planning to go? He said, well, you know, we talked to you about that land about, you know, what was it? What was it, 10 miles away or 60? About five miles, about five miles away. He said, well, he said, you know, I always live in the church, by the church, across the street from the church. And my very words was to my husband, I don't want to live right there. I said, but that is dumb in this neighborhood. I don't want to live here. And he said, he said, and I thought, Lord Jesus, when am I going to learn to keep my mouth shut? I just cannot keep it shut. And my husband said, well, he said, surely, maybe the Lord doesn't want us out there. Maybe we're supposed to be close to the church. And uh, I remember he went in the bank. And the bank said, hey, he said, is it running on the street? He said, yeah. He said, why don't y'all know that land around across the street? He said, you know, it's a big lot of I'll give you a real good deal. That's all he had to say, but he's right. And he said, he said, well, we don't think y'all have this all of a sudden. He said, um, this is about, this is about what, three acres? Well, we found out it had, what, three more later after we bought it. And my husband said, oh, he said, oh, he's not going to that little house next door. My husband's all gone, so I didn't know where he was going. So we ended up buying it, and our house sold. Always take counseling. Don't ever think you're above it. Because I knew when Brother Patton would talk or say something to us, we always listen because that's what Brother taught us. And uh, we bought that. We thought we were settled. We was having a good old time to make it up. She said, just like family. And uh, <clears throat> my husband had a dream. Well, I had a dream. He had a dream. And I kept up with the Macdoche Church. It wasn't that one like that here and there. It was a, it was a house church. But I dreamed it. We was at this airport. And uh, I was holding this baby. And this baby could hold his back up. And his eyes were all mad at me. I just said, oh, Lord. His eyes were all mad at me. And George reached over and took the same and he did like this. And all that stuff just went, just went out from that baby. But he held that baby back up. His eyes were so clear and so blue. This wasn't a new church. This was a baby. This was a church that was stable. The body had been taken out of the hearts. But I didn't play with this church for a long time. I had that dream the night before the cat was walked us here. Well, he called us to visit, but there were a lot of different ministers uh, visiting here at that time. So he called and he said, Brother Ray, he said, why don't you and Sister Shirley come on down and do this on Saturday night? And I didn't think anything about it. No. We come that night, Sister Jane was here with me. We come that night, and Brother Pat and I was sitting out in the congregation, and Brother Pat said, We made a feast before the Lord, that if I got up and sang a song on the give up, then he would know that he put that feast before the Lord. And I had made some negative remarks. I'm sorry, Jane. I'm sorry, Hurst. But I made some negative remarks about the decorations. It was on, uh, Jane didn't do it. But it was orange carpet. The lights were real dark, real dim. And I never seen so many shawls in one place. And I said, 
I reached over and I said, Lady, nobody want to be here for nothing. I said, this place is dying. And uh, Lord, I'm sorry. I apologize to you right now. I never made, I never, I don't talk like that. And I was talking to my friend and she saw that and she's like, hey, what are you saying? I said, and you never said something and immediately you felt convicted. I knew the Lord that they just knew But Brother Patton said, and the Lord said, Sister Charlotte, calm down and sing a song. So I walked down and I thought, I don't know what I'm saying. <clears throat> if the things you're holding to only want is for your soul, why give it up and let Jesus have control? I didn't know what I was saying right then. And uh, you'll be rewarded. You'll be rewarded. And Brother Pat was crying. He said, You knew that night. You knew that night that Brother Brad and I was coming to host. Well, he didn't tell us right then. He didn't see us right then. So we got to come back and forth. Such a big you did at that time, then you sure did. We got to come back and forth. You didn't want to say, What are y'all doing? And I said, Oh, wow. Come on. The brother had to call me and let me say, I want y'all to come to Houston. I want y'all to come to visit us here. And he said, By the way, we love to go to the sister. I love you very much. Oh, Lord Jesus. Look at He has a sister in the room, and he has a sister in the room. Oh, my God, I'm He said, well, I'm going to move it out the house, just like that. I'm going to move it out the house. And all I had to think about was, how am I going to tell them that I'm just thinking about it? But we had to. It was the hardest thing we had to do. And those people I've always loved. They helped me. They helped George for the bride. See, I'm very sweet. Sorry, I'm not going to sleep for so long. We made a lot of fun in our mistakes. But they were the most skinny, skinny people I've ever seen in my life. But we moved here, and what a reward, what a joy to see it here. But one of the things I want to mention, I don't have notes, but one of the things, my husband told me when he first went to ministry, he said, Don't ever take up for me. Don't ever take up for me. He said, If somebody is upset with me and they come to you complaining about me, you don't say anything about me or me. Or try to make excuses for me. He said, You give them a hug. He said, You give them a hug because I just want it to vent. Let them vent to you. And I tried to do that many, many times. Because there's so many times that your husband's not going to do everything right that they think. They're going to be upset. We had to be willing to, to make changes. I had to move. I hope I don't have to move anymore. But if I do, I'll just have to know. That's just as simple as it be. I learned a long time ago that um, you can fix up a home meeting. You can change it to what you want. Um, we bought we had a, when we first here, we bought a house right across the street. And then my husband, he was seeing some things come to me. He said, we looked at this house right across the street. 
and they want me to put the Himalayan bells on top of me. 30 years, 30 years so, they want the Himalayan bells. My husband went home and talked to them and said, no, do you really want to pay that money? Just this way, this is what you want. Because if you're thinking about what my dad said, by the church, in the church, across the street in the church, they came to pay. The very next week, a tornado came through, through Fort Worth and it flooded that house. And John Cornell called and said, Brother Gray, I think I got a job with you. My husband said, Oh, what is it? He said, Well, I can give you that house for 29000 mm -hmm. So we get over there, and I'm looking at that house, and I'm seeing blood, where it flooded. Just, oh, we can do this, we built the house, we've already built two houses, we can do this. We get into there, we got into the piece. Well, I'm just forget about that, but anyway. Yeah. I remember many times I walked across the so help me, and he gets into one more mess. <laughs> Well, it's not like over here. I don't want to get to myself because I'm here. But then I go back and get back to work again. But by the time I got to the house, it was a pretty house. It was a pretty house. But my mother all come down. She was right by the creek. And uh, uh, they saw the rain real heavy. And uh, she kept hearing that. It sounded like you were at the office or something like that. You know, it wasn't on the flood, she could hear it. She started going out the door. So I said, Mama, where are you going? He's anywhere but here. I'm not staying here. I can't believe you moved your family up here and put them in the house. <laughs> he was just laughing at her. But the house did flood. They did flood. The neighbor came in. And he said, he said, anybody want to sell a house? I said, yesterday. And he said, he gave us four or five times more than what we made for that house. Every tree, everything there. So we didn't sell so I said, now where are we going to go? He's right. He said, oh, Lord, the Lord will let us know. He went across the street to this two story house. He said, Anybody would like to buy a buy? Anybody would like to sell a house? And she said, Oh, Bella, I was just hoping that somebody would come by and the rock would come by. She went in and buy that house and they moved out. And I'm telling you, you talk about, I have so much faith now. I don't, I don't worry. If you're just looking at the ministry and you're so worried, I don't worry about it. God will provide, He has provided over and over and over. I think it was two story house. There's a house that comes up for sale down here in the middle of the street. A little country house, not fancy. He says, Son, show me somebody on the back house. Oh, boy, here we go. He says, Somebody on the back house, right there in the street. We're going to take some seats and we're going to let you look at it. I walk in this house. It's got little windows. You know, I said, I'm on my knee, but you were that person, low on the list. Walk in there and look out, and I saw the speech tree loaded. And I could see all of our saints out there having families. And I said, Are you willing to buy this house? Oh, no, you wouldn't live in this house. Psychology. And I said, George, okay, I'll live in this house if yeah. you raise that ceiling, because that ceiling is so big. Promise, promise. He said, I promise. You are going to be close to living in this house. Well, well, yes. So we got in that house, we had a lot of talents, and had almost a whole church. Over there at times, open your home, open your home to God's people. And if we have flowers, 
Não é hora de preparar a luz, para o lugar que se o ar, que está aqui, que é para eles. Então, de novo, se é o ar, é a mão frente, mas se é o ser, assim. Frente, tipo, a partir do meu reto, que se é eles. Aqui no médico, eu não acho que foi muito bom, eu acho que não. Mas, só que ele pegou assim, para eles não, e eles não eram seus lá, para que não dizem, é, e o outro é assim, Not too long, and I'm just passed away. And uh, 
He said, John, just to wonder, is the person is not, uh, she can't be the only lady spirit in the people. I want you to take that position. And I said, oh, for the woman. I don't I don't I don't need a position. I don't have to have I can pray it out. He said, and that's I don't 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 I how big he was, he's six, six, six. And he works with a chassis of the machine. So, he had a pair of house shoes that somehow or other I connected my daughter to town to come to the And um, they were having this, uh, this funny guest at Christmas time. <laughs> and one of my grandsons took those shoes for this silly gift. And to get to some of this. So, I got it. So the day that they we're going to try. This is what we're going to do. This is, this is where I'm place. And uh, all I can say is whatever shoes, we're going to take a little article. Whatever shoes you have to feel, just go ahead and do it. And you know that once the family said, whatever, we know you see that you very holy. We may be going to come to the end of the day and write it so that you let me be sure that whatever you can, thank you. She she's not prepared to talk. I'm sure the Lord can do that. I like to read the tale now. She should have to do it. I'll be very brief. I lost my voice. I don't think that. I'm not prepared at all, but um, the Lord doesn't call me prepared. He prepares you as He calls you. And um, I have a wonderful mother in law who happens to be uh, my, was my pastor's wife, but um, an awesome example. And uh, Sister Brown and Sister Cap. Sister Ryan, and Sister Charmer, and Sister Peach, and you know, the list goes on. And the water can win that we have to look to, to, to know how to do this job. I don't know how to do this job. I'm terribly inadequate and um, very unsure of myself, but I believe that this is where the Lord has us, so we can't say no. You just say, let me pack my bags and hold on for dear life. And um, I will say this, uh, Sister Tim and Sister White, um, I don't know if they knew how scared I was. I'm so scared. But I'm going to read that Sister Tim and Sister White and Sister Brown. They say, You're sitting here. And I was like, Okay, I'm sitting here. This is scared. You know, scared of what? These are not God's people. And uh, it's just scared of the garden that you're carrying. And you don't want to hurt anybody. You don't want to hurt people. You want to treat them right and do what God would have you do. Um, so, I think that's all I have to share. I came from this assembly. I was here 30 years ago. I came from the verse, and uh, the Lord saved me in my boat. And Sister Jane and Sister Ashley, there's only a few of us left, but we're here. I'm <laughs> so glad and I'll say what the Brown said, any place in the house of God is a 
What's the other thing about There's things you can learn just to have a mentor. People talk about having a friend. I learned as a young pastor's wife, don't confide in women. You can't have buddy buddy pastor's wives. I told my buddy buddy, da 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 da. And my husband came back to me and said, Did you tell about them, da da da? I said, Yes, she's what her husband told me. She told me, I said, I learned early. Pastor's wife, you can't have buddy buddies. Your best friend has to be the Lord. And then you learn when things are just really stressful, and it's a good time to see our baby to talk. Because you have to realize he's not only your pastor, he's your husband, he's your lover, he's your friend. So you have to develop a good relationship because you cannot, quote unquote, steal your best self and move. I learned that early. Learn to apologize. Someone talked about that. I just want to take those that are talking. And when the pastor's wife learned this, when two women have a disagreement in your church, you are the pastor's wife to the women's right, and you're the pastor's wife to the women's wrong. You want to break that side. You want to bring reconciliation to the two women. Don't take sides. Let them know, listen, ladies. You can give your skills and always when people in your office, leave them with something to do. I want you to pray, or I want you to da 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 and get back with me. I want you to do that. Also, pastor's wives, when you are counseling, use as few words as you can because they're going to multiply. When they leave your office, she said, Somebody can say, Oh, well, I got it. This is what I can say. That. So be brief, be succinct, and come from the Bible. Your experience is good. You can use your experience in your counseling. But use the word of God. Whatever you have to say, based on the word of God, praise the Lord. Uh, we talked about Sister Betty. Well, we all know Mama Betty. I call her Mama Betty. Sister Betty Jones. She gave us a nugget, and it's wonderful. She says, when you're having problems with your husband, you know, your husband and wife, the things he wants to do, you're free on your She said, tell the man about your man. And that way, and that way, when God deals with your man, the situation is this, 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 So learn to do that. Praise the Lord. I talk about using the words, oh, women, I learned this too. I was driving. Uh, she just got to LA, and, and my husband and I have started several churches. We, uh, he's been over 14 churches, so most of you know. We had retired last June, or 2022, and the Lord saw fit to take uh, Brother Clark away from us. So, I have to take the reins again. So I, I enjoy being retired. I enjoy going and just, you know, I can do da 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 on the piano. But when people have no music, they're glad for any music. So I'm in any music. So I was like, <laughs> that. Praise the Lord. You have the responsibility of being pastor's wife. Just go so and get your music, whatever. But I'm back in the cell again as a pastor's wife. But the Lord told me this you've got to love the good. The bad and the good. Women, I'm going to tell you, all women are not going to love you, but that's not their responsibility to love you. But you want to win them. Never write a woman off. She doesn't like me, I don't like her. No, you're trying to pray, God, what can I do? A sneakers walk? A card? Can I invite her to lunch? You want to win a sister. Never have a white sister off. Praise the Lord. One of the Lord gave me is going upstairs sometime. In order to work effectively with your husband, you've got to get in his spirit. My husband is patient, very patient. He believes in digging around several times, digging around the fertilizer, digging around the water. I come from the corporate world. You give them an assignment, they mess up, that's okay. You show them the big one. They mess up again, you show them again, and it's too stressful. But then that's up again, three strikes, you're out. I'm not this about yes to this. But I have to learn. You can't do that. You cannot do that with women. So before you put some a lady over, pray with it. Because once you give a lady an assignment and some women there, you know, just fine on it. And so, oh, have you done that? Oh, who does that do? I say, no, woman, don't you know better than that? I took, you can't. You can't fire them. You can't lay them off. Okay? <laughs> so you've got to be able to do, learn how to do that. 
that well. Um, okay, let's see. Get that done. I think, praise the Lord, this is kind of just free for all. But I hope I said something with it that you can utilize. Being a pastor's wife, amen, it is a calling. And I realized this John the Baptist was a man sent from God. Women, our husbands are men. They hurt. And I love what she said. You got to hold them sometime. Sometimes it's not words, it's just sweetheart. Just sweetheart. It's okay. It's okay. Women, they need that soft touch because they do have to make a lot of decisions. But women, remember, we cannot be saved. We cannot overcome um, if we are a pastor's wife without loving God's people, without uh, supporting the church in whatever way the So I thank God for all of you. I don't know all of your names, I don't know more faces, but I believe tremendously for you. And thank everyone that got up here and said something. And Shaggy, I think I told you, you are the one for the job. I think you were, just, I told you that. I don't think you were pastors like me. But I knew you were, or you are, the one for the job. She got the new performer at the moment. I love when she does. She has all the things. Thank you, thank you, sister. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sister Shaw. Oh, thank you for coming. I'll get to you later. Thank you. Thank you. We are in Houston. Everything is happy. We had so much fun in here. So she came to know that we were on it. She started working back in the time. Thank you, Sister Kim. I, I, I never used her as far as I can say that I'm going to read. There we go, it's me. But I feel this time I want to do something. Thank you, Sister Kim. I know you was not a situation at all. Sister Amy, thank you for opening your home to all of us women. And, um, and I said, Sister Amy, I said, do we have a team room? We're back yarn. And she said, sure. She never has a time. Never had it. She said, sure, Sister Brian, yeah. And she just went with it. So thank you, Amy. So I think when um, Sue Watson come forward, but thank you all for the offer. Just thank you. That's all I have to say. Love you, women, so much. I'm enjoying Sister Sharper's message. I was in the way with Sister Sharper. Are we talking about Sister Wayne? Are we talking about it? When we mentioned Sister Wayne, we were just perfect. At the right time, I go down. He said, That's my mama. Thank you all for being here. So we're getting ready to dispense and we need your help. As you can tell, it's been exciting. And I appreciate you all bearing with us. So what's going to happen? If they haven't already set your table, they're in the process of doing that. As soon as my son needs me to okay, what you're going to do is you're just going to we're going to dismiss you, you're going to look at the glass doors, and you're going to go to the sanctuary, and we're going to have all of the men on, that are on this side, we're going to ask them to move over so that y'all can go in there. And then we're going to dismiss the ministry and meet up with your husbands. And you'll come, please make sure you meet your husbands down that hall. They got confused yesterday. They were lost without you. So, We're in the process of getting more of these made. So, uh, hopefully, the bigger you see me. I thought that it's. That's what we're for. And we're trying to see the So, that's not what happened to my mom. 
Okay, so if you would, um, just uh, ladies, y'all go ahead and start setting them. And if y'all would, would don't mind if y'all can stand and allow them to set the tables. And then as soon as they allow me, I'll send you to the future. But right now, just stay in here. Okay?